And I just want to welcome you to the Friday webinar today. So in the chat box, there's a Google Doc there. I'm going to post that link again in a moment because I believe if you've just joined after I shared that in the chat box, you don't actually see it. So I'm going to set it in there in a second again. I'm going to share my screen and start to show you what's in there so you know how to navigate and follow along. There are a few things to do. Here's the file that I've shared with you in the chat box. For those of you that don't have it, just give me a moment. I'm going to put it in there again now. If you don't see anything in the chat box, there will be something there. Now click on that file, and that's going to give you access to this Google Doc that I've got on my screen. Now I see a lot of you have been able to get into it. If you haven't already, you're going to want to print off the marking grid. There's three links here on the page, actually four links, but the top three pertain to us right now. The first link is a marking grid, which I'll explain in a moment. I know a lot of you have asked questions about that marking grid and how it works. I'm going to go over that first. Also, the marking form, so you can mark along. For everybody, this is your first chance to download the marking form for today's exam. So you're going to want to click on that second link, download and print. And then the third link is to the mock exam itself, which we're all going to watch separately on our own devices over the next 25 minutes or so in a few minutes. So you can click on the YouTube link shortly when I get to it. And at the bottom, there's a link to the digital, bas the digital badge syllabus, which I'm going to cover in next week's Friday webinar on May 20th. I know I've mentioned digital badges a lot to the audiences in the past, but this is something that we're testing out, and I'll talk in quite a bit of detail about it next week's session. But there's a sneak peek in it if you want to get ahead and do some advanced homework, as it were. Those of you that have just joined in the chat box is a Google Drive link, which will give you access to this Google Doc that I'm sharing on my screen right now that contains marking grid, marking form, and a link to the YouTube exam, which we're all going to watch separately in a few moments. We're all going to take time to evaluate together. And then after, I, 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 I also watch with you, so I know when abouts you're done, I'll come back and then I'll share my slideshow with you where we can go over in detail everything that we've done, come up with some marks, some rationale, some heavy duty commentary. You can ask your questions. It's an exciting time because this is our first look, really. We've been doing contemporary exams since 2007, and I believe this is the first mock exam that we've ever been able to attempt using a CI piano student. So it's exciting for me. I hope you all find it exciting. I know a lot of you have not used the contemporary against piano syllabus. A lot of you have. And those, you know, all of you, whether you have or haven't, are probably dying to see exactly how this looks behind the scenes. So it's very exciting for me to share that with you today. So again, if anyone's just joined, I'm going to paste that link one more time in the chat box so that you can get up to speed with what's happening. If you've joined just a minute late, Again, just click that Google Doc link, print off the first two files in this Google Doc, and then click the link to YouTube after that in a few minutes, and we'll all watch it simultaneously, just not on my screen or not through my screen, because that degrades the audio quality quite a bit, and I think you'll all be able to make your own fair assessment without me having to stream that exam. <clears throat> you'll all get a link to this later, replay link. For those of you that are watching, you've already accessed the replay link. This inside the folder that I'm sending you by email, or I have sent you by email for those watching in the future, you're going to see this document, the README file, it's called README Mock Exam May 13. Click on that in the folder I've sent you, print off the first two forms, and then you can view the exam on either the YouTube link there, or if you're watching later, inside the folder is an MP4 that you can just look at directly rather than going to YouTube. I'm going to switch over to my slideshow now. Let's talk about a few things before we start. So this is mock exam, contemporary piano level five. The marking grid I shared with everybody about a month ago for the first time at the mock exam primer. And then again, uh, three weeks ago when we did that first mock exam with grade four piano classical. And, and I didn't explain how it used. I know a lot of you asked, hey, how does, how does this thing actually work? How do I use the marking grid? <coughs> because of Conservatory Canada, Everything we mark and grade is to decimal point one. We needed a way so that if we were marking something out of six, let's say, we need to know we have the examiners thinking in percentiles. So let's say what's out of six background questions. The student answered all their background questions. Often they get six out of six, but I want to give them 5.5 out of six. I want to know what percentage that is. So I take the number six at the top row and I follow all the way down to 5.5 out of six and I see that that's 92%. So I can use it that way, but a more common way to use it would be say when I'm assessing technique, 
technique today is out of 14 marks. So I go along the top axis to the number 14 in the top row. And with my finger, I go down the scale from 50% all the way down to 100%. And I kind of know where I want to be. I have it in my head that the student's going to get 87% in their technique. I follow the 14th column down until I see 87%. And I have to actually use my finger. And I see it's 12.2. So I know that my mark is 12.2 out of 14 for the student to get 87% on that particular element. If the piece is worth 12, which they are today, you're going to be using that 12 column a lot. Along the top row, top axis, the number 12. I actually physically put my pencil tip. I've got a, usually a plastic sheet over this, so I don't dirty the marking grid or I use my finger. And I slide down and I say, okay, this piece is worth 84%. I slide down and I find 84% and I see that I need to enter 10.1 out of 12 for that particular piece. So we can use this an infinite number of ways. It's a really handy tool. The examiners all have it, they all rely on it. And this is the type of precision that we try to use when we're marking. And even the final mark comes out to 88.3, whatever it's gonna be. Okay, so I hope I've explained that well. Any questions about the marking grid? And any questions at any time, go ahead and throw them in the chat box. I know from time to time, even as we're watching the exam, I'll be wa as we're watching the exam together on YouTube simultaneously alone, uh, I'll be monitoring that chat box. I know some of you have trouble uh, hearing audio and things like that within YouTube, and I can try and help you. The marking form, you're all going to print this off. And this is a marking form for Contemporary Idioms Piano. And you know, now that I look at this a little more closely, this is not the standard marking form. I have to apologize. I've given you a link to grade four piano classical. Oh no, you know what? I just simply haven't changed the image <laughs> on my slide from the last mock exam. So you're gonna have, you have a marking form there. It's just not the marking form that I'm showing on the screen. You're gonna have this other marking form that's a lot more complicated. I'm sure you can see that uh, if you printed it off or through the readme file. And you'll notice in a contemporary idioms piano exam, one third of the way down at the skills, it says contemporary idiom skills. And then there's a row for technique, sight reading, ear training, improvisation, background information, and applied skills. And then right under that, it says classical skills, technique, sight reading, ear training, keyboard skills, background information. This may be a bit confusing to some of you. Uh, a lot of you that have used contemporary idioms before may know and should know. Um, but I apologize, we don't advertise this very well. And this is why I wanted to use this opportunity to bring it up today. And I've started to mention this more often. Students that are doing a contemporary idioms piano exam actually have the option to do either contemporary skills or the classical skills from the same level or grade from the classical syllabus. So today you're going to see contemporary skills, which includes the improvisation and the applied skills, which we don't normally see on the classical exam. And a lot of students, teachers, you know, that's new material for them. They're not comfortable for one reason or another. They don't find the students working hard enough to achieve those newer skills. They've never covered them before they're jumping in at level five or something. Whatever the reason, there are a lot of reasons. A lot of teachers are having their students sign up for a CI piano exam. And when they get to the exam, they tell the examiner, today I'm doing classical skills. And we use the bottom section there for grade five classical piano to evaluate the skills. The students get to do the contemporary repertoire but the more familiar classical skills. So there's an option there, we call it sort of mix and match. And I've got that on the screen here. Students can prepare CI or classical skills on CI piano exams. We cannot do the reverse, we're on a classical piano exam, we use the contemporary skills, we don't offer that option. So this is a way that we can get really friendly and customize the exam experience for the student. And on the marking form, what I've simply done is I put a line through the classical skills, there will be no marks entered there because those marks will add up to like 156 or something like that out of 100. It's either one or the other. And so examiners know to ask that of the student. And students that are doing classical skills or contemporary skills should be coached to know the difference so that they can tell the examiners the single most important question at the beginning of a CI piano exam. And you'll see that I ask this at the beginning of this exam. Are we doing classical or contemporary skills today? The student didn't know, and that's common. And so I have a backup way of asking, and you'll see that in the exam, so that I can discern which set of skills, which syllabus I'm to be using in that moment. You don't let the examiner or the staff know in advance. It's something that just happens in person right away. 
I don't have access to the rep music. I'll be honest, uh, when we're doing online exams, if you're scheduling a flex exam with two weeks notice, you can send the repertoire to the examiner. If you're part of the June session where we're examining students by center, those examiners don't want to see repertoire. It's an administrative nightmare for them. And so with online exams, generally, I don't see the repertoire. I didn't ask for it in advance in this case either. And I'll be honest, reggae, I've heard, uh, we're hearing reggae by Andrew Harbridge. I've, I've heard that piece, but I've never seen it. Bumblebee and Lavender by Martha Meir. I don't have that in my library. River Flows in You, I know pretty intimately. Whistle and Joe, uh, you'll, you'll notice that the student didn't know the composer. I didn't even know where to find that score. So I've never seen the music. But you'll see through my next slide and, and what I'm, when I'm talking through the evaluation, we're not listening in that much detail. Yeah, it's nice to see the music there, but there are, there's a way to listen that we actually don't need it for. And so I'm sorry, I don't have a repertoire to share today, uh, but I hope you get some benefit from what I'm saying and you're watching the examining process that narrows your listening down. And this is the training we're doing with examiners in the last couple of years during the pandemic. I think it's been really great for examiners to not have the repertoire in most cases. It gets them listening in a refined way and the marks are starting to tighten up a little bit more um, from examiner to examiner, let's say. Uh, feel free to grill me on that and ask me more questions about that, Green. Thanks for asking. And uh, we can come back to that later in the webinar today. Uh, Marianne's asking, in CC, is there a book for each level in classical and contemporary? That's a great question. So there is a book for each level. It, classical piano is the new millennium series here. Here's book six for classical piano. All the repertoire in here that is modern in nature can be used on the, the contemporary readings exam as well. But most teachers use this as sort of a staple book. Um, you don't have to. And then in contemporary idioms, I just happen to have here our staple books, which are the Canadian contemporary repertoire series, which look like this. These are published by us. This is level one, I believe. Yep. We have levels one to five in here. The classical books go from grade one to 10. Contemporary is level one to five. And then the other books we have are published by Hal Leonard, the Canadian, no, the contemporary piano repertoire, also level one to five. These are Hal Leonard books. And this is what they look like, full of more pop stylings. Canadian composers, Andrew Harbridge, Deborah Wanless, et cetera, many others. Pop music, pop stylings right out of Helen's library from about 13 years ago or so. So those are the two staple books. But then from there, I've got Christopher Norton connections. I've got a lot of Christopher Norton, honestly, Andrew Harbridge, Tyler Seidenberg's books, Deborah Wanless's books, uh, tons of other stuff that I supplement with all the time, multiple copies hand the second copy to the student for a few weeks so they've got something to work from. So that's what we do in terms of repertoire. That's a great question. And yes, we do have books, uh, but with our expansive repertoire and free approvals, we're encouraging everyone just to get outside the box. You can even use conservatory books from other institutions. Uh, a well-known conservatory just published a new piano syllabus with new piano repertoire books. If you've got those coming to you, you can use any of that repertoire and CC exams. If it's not on our list, just send us a copy of what that looks like so we can appraise it for you for free and students can use those pieces on the exam. Okay, grade or CI piano level five for those that don't know how this is put together. Here's a quick snapshot of the mark distribution so you understand what we're going to be hearing today in the exam shortly. Four pieces, each worth 12 marks. Only two have to be memorized to get the two bonus marks. So that's half of the exam right there, 50%. Technique. You're going to hear just a few different things. You're going to hear some modes. You're going to hear some seventh chords. Um, you're going to hear us ask questions in background information and applied skills on putting together different scales, um, demonstrating things instead of playing them two octaves up and down. This syllabus in its previous iteration up until 2017 was quite rich. It was, no, I'd say even 2016 we revised it, sorry. It had a lot there. There was a lot of heavy technique. We gutted it. We, we took a lot of that stuff out. But we want students to develop a vocabulary for chord building, scale building, et cetera. So we've taken a lot of that and put it into this thing called applied skills, where students have the mental knowledge in their mind of how it works, but they only have to demonstrate that they know one octave, one hand ascending only. And so you'll see that in action. It's a really great way to still develop that chord vocabulary without students having to endlessly go through all these patterns, all these different types of seventh chords, hands together two octaves. It's absolutely daunting or it was absolutely daunting. Now you'll see it's much simpler. <clears throat> I think I have a shot of the technique here too, I can show you. 
Sight reading and ear training are going to be incredibly familiar. For those of you that do classical piano, they're almost identical. In ear training, just a little bit different. You have to hear seven chords. Otherwise, most of it's identical. The examples are even identical a lot of the time. Improvisation, you get a good look at that. The, the, the student is going to improvise hands together to a backing track. And then the improv piece in this case is a lead sheet. Students have three choices starting at level five CI piano. For improv piece, they can sight read a lead sheet, putting chords in the left hand, single notes in the right hand. You'll see that today. Or students don't like to do that because the keys are difficult. It's a lot of extra work, it's a lot of sight readings, a lot of chord building. They can simply improvise on a 12 bar blues pattern that they invent and they provide a backing track for. Or they could submit their own composition and play it like a supplementary piece or an own choice piece. So there's a lot of choice there starting at level five. Levels one to four contemporaneous piano students have to be able to sight read lead sheets. So they at least get a little bit of help or a little bit of background in that. It's very similar to keyboard harmony. And you're going to get to see what that looks like during the exam. Background information is very similar to uh, background information in the classical piano syllabus. The questions are a little bit different. We don't focus so much on signs and terms, and at least I didn't in this particular exam. I focus more on composers. The student has the opportunity to prepare one composer and give me details about it, so they, they feel comfortable with that composer. They choose the composer. A lot of these are modern composers. Sometimes it's hard to find biographical information. And then they also get to choose one of the genres of the pieces that they chose, in this case, reggae style. And the student tells me all about reggae style. It's pre-scripted but it's still useful and it's hard for students to communicate orally to us in the exam room and you'll hear that today the student does a marvelous job he outputs rather well it just takes him a minute to recall all that stuff it's an absolutely critical skill and, and we're really happy to still be able to offer background information skills worth six marks on any of our exams any questions so far about the syllabi material i'll go into a lot more detail and some more questions as we get into the exam together i'm sure things will occur to you as you're watching uh, critical listening protocol, we went through this last time, and I want to go through it again for those that are just joining. This is where the examiners are being encouraged, and we're all listening in a more direct way. Not too much detail, but broad strokes. What are we hearing? You'll see. This exam clicks right along, and when he's finished playing the piece, even at level five, it's a little longer. I'm almost done writing, commenting, and marking a number. By the time he's done, and we're on to the next one. I don't want to keep him waiting. And so we have to have a focused way of listening and evaluating that's accurate so that we can get it right. And this structure, I think, provides a really good way. If I also have the score there as well, now I feel like I'm getting lost in the detail. I'm not listening as much. I've got my eyes open. This is what we teach in the improv component. When we burden the student with a, with, with a sheet of music to look at, it slows the whole musical process in the brain down. If I blinded out my eyes and I just watch him produce sound on the screen and I've got my ears more open just like an improv the magic starts to happen everything comes together more quickly I'll say this about improv too um, for those that haven't tried it with students it's really amazing we're using American popular piano etudes series you won't necessarily get to see this in action today I don't think I'm quick enough to provide you with what the student's looking at that might be we'll see how it goes um, but we're trying to uh, it's best used as a rote learning method I don't show my students the music anymore until maybe level three or level four. And even then, by then, they've, they've got it hardwired. They're working 90% from their ear, and it all comes together quite nice. It takes a little bit of time at first, but once they wire up the skill at level one, it's easier to transfer, and, and improv becomes a real joy. The, the beauty in it is the backing tracks created by Christopher Norton. That informs the student's ear, and I have that playing 100% of the time now when I'm working improv with students. Um, so you'll see that in action, what the final result is. You're going to have all sorts of questions if you haven't done it before as to how you get to that point. I've got a couple of really good video tutorials on the CI Piano page on the website, which is back up and running for those who have been wondering. And if you watch those, you'll see how I break it down with students. I think it's a really great way to look at it. So critical listening protocol, we listen in layers. We have to hear rhythm first along with correct notes. And if we hear that, the examiner's ear goes to articulation and we start to assess what is legato, what is staccato, are there gestures involved in the articulation? How clearly are the notes being spoken? How smooth is the legato if we need it that way? How much space is in the sound? And then if we hear that, that that's being thought out, our ear goes to the next layer, which is phrasing, inflection, and dynamics. How expressive is it? Even through the internet, are we able to hear these obvious differences through the microphone? If that's in place, then we can go to style performance practice. And by the time we get here, we're well into the 80s. A student, if they're not rhythmically sound and things aren't happening, there's hesitations and it's just 
The examiner's ear stops at the rhythm level. Their comments are focused on rhythm and pulse, lack of it, metronome, maybe a helpful comment here and there. Um, and we don't even go to articulation. We just stop there. We want that foundation layer in place and our comments will reflect that. The mark will be in the 70s. If the rhythm is stable enough and you have that foundation layer in place, we've achieved an 80% and then articulation gets us a little bit into the 80s. Phrasing and flexion and dynamics gets us a little further into the mid 80s. Style and performance practice elevates the mark into the high 80s. And then to get a 90, we want to hear the structure of the piece and the depth of the communication. What's the sound like? Is the student trying to communicate here? Are they hitting me with enough sound that it sounds interesting? Am I compelled to listen more? Can I hear that the song has a beginning, a middle, and an end? Were they thoughtfully transitioning between those places? That's how we get into the 90s. And then around all of that at the bottom of the core sound and tone quality, that's always at the front of our mind. Really important for singers, string players, woodwind players, brass players, we assess their tone instantly. Piano, we don't so much, but examiners are listening for it. What's the weight of the sound like? Is it resonating through the room or is it something just produced locally without any flexibility for the student's own enjoyment? How is the music hitting me? Okay, so that's a sort of a brief outline. I'll talk more about the protocol as we get into the assessment when I come back and I'll share my slideshow with, with my marks for how I've marked. And then of course, at the end, I'll, I'll wanna hear how you marked as well. So I'm gonna stop there. And now's the time to go to the YouTube link in that Google Doc. If anyone didn't get the Google Doc, here it is one more time. If you've joined late, you need to click on this link, go to the Google Doc that it represents, and there are three links in there, a marking form, a marking grid, and the third link is to YouTube, which I'm sure a lot of you are on now ready to watch. If you aren't already, go ahead and watch the exam, mark along with the marking form. We come back here when it's done. I'll do the same on my end. I'm going to mute my microphone so you're not going to hear me do anything. You might see me in the background. And then we'll come back and we'll compare notes. So I'll be watching the chat box as well if anything happens. Remember when you go into YouTube, sometimes it's auto muted and you have to unmute the mute button to actually hear what's going on depending on your settings. So enjoy, any questions I'll keep watching and we'll come back in about 25 minutes or so. Okay, so we'll just take another minute here for those just finishing up the ear training piece. Some of you will be done now. Any questions or first impressions, go ahead and throw them in the chat box. I answered a few questions as we went there. I don't want to continue on until you've all had a really fair chance here, but we will go on for about another half hour on comparing notes and marks. So those of you that uh, are watching this in the future, after the webinar is over on the replay link, if you've come this far and you haven't seen the actual exam yet, you need to go to the README file in the folder that I shared in your email. In there, you'll see marking grid, marking form, replay link. Um, you'll see the YouTube link. Go on the YouTube link and assess the exam yourself now, then come back to this spot in the replay of the webinar and we can compare notes from here. I'll talk about counting out loud. Students are welcome to count out loud if they like. Some find it helpful. Mic placement. Yeah, that was an interesting thought by Marilyn. Suzanne, you're following up on that. Um, it can. For a lot of people, they're not using an external mic. I'm not, I can't remember for sure if this family was using an external mic. I think they were. But even still, I can I feel I can hear both hands equally. It's just for me, it, I, I feel he just needs more tone from the right hand. The reason that we're picking up more bass 
could simply just be, yeah, okay, maybe the bass is louder, but I'm not seeing anything physically with my eyes that he's doing to project the right hand more. And I feel like his brain is in his left hand more in some cases, that's all. So number one, you know, what can families do about it? This is something more you can solve in your own teaching studio if students are coming to your studio to do the exam. Of course, with digital software, we don't have this problem. It's just coming out of the digital piano, but a Zoom exam or musicology app uh, can only pick up so much and most people don't have the, the external mic. So I would suggest take the external mic and experiment in your studios. If you know, prepare that in advance, that's, that's basically we're relying on the teachers to sort of take care of that uh, ahead of time. But I'm noticing when I'm recording students a lot for online recitals and things, I'm getting pickier and pickier about these types of things. My mic level, the mic placement, the setting on my mic, all that kind of stuff. I actually unplug my computer so that it's not humming and revving up too loud and the mic's picking it up. Wh whatever I think I need to do to, to make the students sound as good as they can. Um, and so we're becoming sort of, you know, technically savvy that way. But that's a good point that a lot of you pick that up. For me though, I, I'm encouraging students to play in a certain way. If we're recording something, I, I point out to them the differences. We're constantly watching back the recordings and making adjustments physically more for recording technique. We're not, this isn't live performance anymore. This is, I have to create a recording. And so they can become little mini recording engineers and their exam, if that reflects that probably will help. In this case though, I just felt like he just didn't have weight in his right hand enough to penetrate in a couple of places. It wasn't overly costly though. Okay, so we're gonna go back to my slideshow here and we'll continue on and talk about the exam bit by bit. You know, before we start, actually, let's go back and do one more thing. Uh, just put in the chat box what you think the overall mark is if you've had time to add it up. Just throw a number in the chat box if you're comfortable getting that, if you feel like you've got a, a final mark. Otherwise, I'll ask you later. Or you know, just overall impression, even, even without adding it up, where do you think the student's at? And we can compare afterward and I can share what I've done with, with, you, with them as well. Okay, critical listening protocol. Let's get into technique. We started with technique on this particular exam. We give students the choice. Do you want to do technique or pieces? Some students, they can override that and say sight reading or ear training, whatever they want. If they want to start with improv, they can. But we try to give them a little bit of choice, but not too much choice um, so that we get, some, get, get the exam going. Sometimes students freeze if they have too much choice. Good recall and fluency with those elements. The pulse is steady what I call safe tempos. You know, did he quite meet the minimum tempo? A couple of times, just a little bit below minimum tempo, but it was safe and it was steady. Nice shape to the scales, a little bit of crescendo diminuendo. It's nice to hear that. Uh, the swing eighth scale sounded good starting on the short note. This is something a lot, a lot of you may not realize that when we launched contemporary readings, we did a lot of workshops and what came out uh, with the experts that we're using at the time was that swing eighth notes sound better when we start on a short note, ta-da, 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 and we accent the offbeat a little bit. And so that's what this student is aware of and knows. So it's nice to hear that's not absolutely necessary. So students can do it a couple ways. I'm accenting the short note and I'm starting with the short note. That's an authentic way to do it. You can start with the long note. My mic should be picking that up. I'm accenting again, I'm accenting the short note. I'm accenting the off beats in this kind of music. We tend to ask, ask a mix of swing scales and straight eighth note scales. Good leverage from the arms providing round tone. You hear that especially in solid chords. Just a bit cautious with tempo, but strong with accuracy. And so overall I was thinking 12.3 to 14, which for me is 88%. Pretty strong technique, well prepared, well executed. Piece number one, we went on to the repeat the pieces. This is reggae by Andrew Harbridge. Steady pulse with suitable tempo. There's only one hesitation. I'm hardly really noting that. There's some accent to beat two and four. You can use even more reggae. A lot of these reggae arrangements have these left-hand accents on beats two and four. And if the student brings that out a little bit more, that can be really helpful in the style. A lot of contemporary music, the accent shifts to the off beats. And it's good for students to try and capture that. We don't hear very many students doing that. Good use of lifted articulations. There's a, there's a crispness to the articulation. It's, it's, it's well thought out. 
it's not just all mushy and kind of vague. It's 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 got some vibrancy to it. So I'm thinking well into the 80s here. There's some dynamic variety coming through, but it could be more exaggerated. Okay. Overall, just a careful, steady approach. He did the job. He got the job done. And so out of 12, I'm looking at 10.5 out of 12. Really solid. I'm you know, somewhere between 87 and 88 when I look at my marking grid. Close to a 90. I'd like, I just want to hear a little bit more from the dynamics and a little more communication power. Just a little bit safe. But you know, I'm I'm sort of thinking, you know, from what I've heard of the students so far. I want to hear the next piece. I want to hear, is he, is he able to communicate that bit more? Are we, can we get into the 90s or are we stuck at 87? Piece number two, Bumblebee and Lavender, Martha Mir. Strong left hand boogie bass. Right hand could be a bit stronger to project the melody more over the busy left hand. For me, it was a matter of there's a lot of notes in the left hand and fewer notes in the right hand. And whether you're live or through a microphone, the left hand is easy to overpower. I just wasn't seeing that he was doing enough, he had enough strength in that right hand. His brain appeared and his eyes appeared to be looking at the left hand more. That's fine. Uh, listen for more accented feel on beats two and four. Pulse is steady. So I'm commenting on rhythm at the beginning, accuracy and rhythm. And then my ear moves up a little bit. Could benefit more from more dynamic contrast in the movie section. However, in the middle section, there's a nice mood and color change with special treatment of the transitions and some phrasing inflection. We can adapt some of that into the right hand of the, of the first and last section. That would be even better. Middle section could benefit from adding pedal for resonance. I wasn't picking up any extra resonance or color through the microphone today. That's just a fine detail, but something that would probably help the student. I should note as well, you know, this student was in progress, right? He wasn't really looking for perfection, I don't think, today. He was looking to give us something to comment on as well and still had a couple of weeks, two or three weeks to go before his actual exam. Uh, and so, you know, we applaud him for that. He's given us something to talk about, which is really great. And so to me, this is well into the 80s. But to push into the 90s, there needs to be a bit of pedal. There needs to be a bit more projection and excitement in that right-hand melody in the first section. He, he could have solved that quite nicely in the next in the next couple of weeks before his exam. So I don't want to take that away from him. 10.4 to 12, that's 87%. So in that range still. Still looking for a little more if we're going to move on, but the student is stronger than most so far. River flows in you. Most of us have heard this piece. We appraise this at the grade 8 level generally when it comes in. And you can use up to one, any one piece on any one exam can be any grade level higher. And this is level five. So the fact that he's using this piece is a pretty interesting bonus. The pulse is fluid. I wouldn't write the word more, but because we're comparing notes here, the pulse is more fluent in this one. There's a little bit of extra movement, a little bit of extra excitement. I've been describing this lately to students as uh, listening to what's in between the notes and trying to control what's in between those notes. The piano's always decaying every time we move it. He's just giving us a little more movement through that pulse. Right hand is overpowered slightly at times through the mic there, I've commented on it. Using inflection and more dynamics to show off phrasing. He's using inflection and dynamics to show off the phrasing in this one compared to the last one. This isn't exactly how I would phrase this on an exam. Uh, danger of rushing slightly in the 16th in the middle section. There's some nice flexible rubato happening. It gets a little too emotional, you know, maybe three, almost four notches greater on the metronome at times. It's a little bit too much. It'd be nicer to hear the restraint in that and use the dynamic to create the excitement. This is a really fine point. By the time we start commenting on this stuff, we're in the high 80s at least. Lovely flexibility in the pulse at times, despite that little bit of rushing. That's a very fine comment. More to say, you know, this is more like 90, 91 instead of 95. Strong connection to the sound and good communication. This is what I was wanting to hear in the first two, if I wanted to hear a 90. But in this one, I'm really hearing it. Right hand overpowered slightly. It's, it's a bit of a thing, but again, it's coming through the mic. Uh, we, we give a little bit of leeway there. And to me, this is into the 90s. I was really happy to hear it. 11.1 out of 12 would be my mark. That's 92 and a half, roughly. So I got to check the chat box for just a second. Why can't I see the chat box? Oh, you know what? I bet I'm not sharing my screen. I apologize. Uh, and I've got questions here. Oh, no, hang on. I'm sorry. I'm going to go back and, and share my screen with those folks. I realize now that I wasn't sharing my slideshow and I'm going through my notes here. Let's go back just so you can see this. And then I'll go back to the questions. My apologies. Here's technique. My comments, again, you can, you can do this again later on replay if you want to really see what I've done. I know you're listening to what I'm saying, but it's not the same. You can actually see it. 12.3 to 14 technique. Reggae, 
There are the comments. There's the mark. And again, this isn't exactly how the comments would be phrased, but pretty close how we want to see the comments. We're trying to refrain from teaching comments or helpful comments on the exam report. Sometimes an examiner will include it because we realize some teachers like it. We're trying to justify our marks. We're trying to just take the snapshot uh, for the most part. And you can see by doing the process yourself, there isn't a lot of time to add those comments. There are things we don't know about the student's background and we don't want to know. So the minute we start adding helpful comments as examiners, we're treading on shaky ground, right? And I'll comment a little bit on the counting out loud later. Again, I, I don't know the student's background and I don't wanna try and solve problems when it's not my job to teach. That's the job of the mini lesson. If the student sends up for a mini lesson, then we can have a blast and we can go through these things and, and get into a bit more detail that isn't reflected in the words on the page. Bumblebee and Lavender, there's 10.4. There's, there's my script there. You can check that out later. River flows in you. Okay, catching up. Oh, this is where we just left off. 11.1 over 12. Those are how my comment, those are how my comments look. Now I can get back to the chat box and see. Okay, Marilyn, I was confused about the technique mark for temporary skills and technique mark for classical skills. Okay, so I hope that's clear. Um, it's either classical or contemporary skills and on the marking form, we choose one or the other depending on what the student has prepared because classical technique is a whole different set of skills and questions for the most part. Uh, and Kim, 12.6 in the technique, thanks for that. Okay, Whistle and Joe, the fourth piece, the pulse is fluent and forward with suitable flexibility, lovely foundation. Uh, this, the students using articulation and dynamics and inflection to express, boom, the mark shoots up into the high 80s at least. Consider accenting beats two and four for a more authentic feel. That's hard for students to do, and it's hard for us as classically trained musicians, myself included, to accept that. But there's something in the dialect that we call backbeat in this kind of music that's injected in, and, and that's a way to do it. It feels weird at first, but after a while, you realize it really adds excitement to the music. Polite performance with good expression, a very enjoyable performance. That, that's a very common comment you might see. He couldn't recall the composer's name. That gets notated on the form if something's wrong, either in the background information section. Sometimes we put it next to the piece and it reminds us and it reminds the student that with one thing that was missed, so that background info mark is maybe a little bit lower later. And so here, 10.9 out of 12, I thought it was enough for 91%. For I used the marking grid to achieve the 10.9 in my mind to do, so I didn't have to do the math. Um, it was nice to see the first two pieces are a certain way, second two pieces build on that. Smart way to, to create the program. The student could have done these pieces in any order. He saved the best for last in terms of the progression. I think that's a wise way to do it but not the only way, that's for sure. Background information and applied skills. He was able to identify pieces, composers, titles, just missed one composer. He gave us quite a few details about Andrew Harbridge for this level, able to comment intelligently on reggae and recall all that stuff. I refrain from asking about signs and terms, but typically examiners will find a way to make it happen. At my level five, we don't focus on that so much and we had taken so much time to talk about other things. And by the time you get through the applied skills, by level five, sometimes this part will go missing on the exam. It's only six marks. We assume they know all that stuff, but it certainly is at the examiner's discretion to hold up a book and say, what does this sign mean through the camera or in person? Uh, that can still happen from levels five to eight. He was able to play and demonstrate all the elements asked and only one octave ascending is required. And you saw how that kind of worked within applied skills. And maybe you have some questions about that. Feel free to share or ask. Sight reading. <clears throat> okay, clapping and playing is pretty good. It's pretty good sight reading. This works out to seven out of eight, uh, which is a very good mark for sight reading. In clapping, it was accurate. Pulse not quite steady. And this is where I felt that the counting out loud, when I usually hear students count out loud on the exam, it, there tends to be issues. Small issues usually, sometimes larger issues. In this case, it was just small things where his counting wasn't able to stay steady in a couple of places for the clapping. 1.8 out of two, and then in the playing, uh, counting out loud seemed to be inhibiting somewhat there, I felt. And I made that comment to him after, after we stopped the recording, I shared quite a bit of feedback with him because that's what he was in it for. So any student just know that they do get quite a bit of feedback from me, almost like a mini lesson if they're doing the mock exam so that they can use that to prepare. And it just seemed, I think counting out loud is a great skill. I don't do it enough with my students because I find it absolutely cripples them. So I, I abandoned it a long time ago, more or less in favor of other more ear-based methods. 
um, and they learn the math. And as students get older, they have to be able to explain that math. And it's tricky. That's just my way of doing it because I found that students struggle. So on an exam, if I see students take that counting out loud and just internalize it without counting out loud and start subdividing, it gives them less to think about, less to perform. It doesn't slow them down quite so much. Those are just my thoughts. And that's just what I'm seeing. For this student, this still may be the best approach. It's up to him and his teacher to decide. And it's up to the examiner to get out of the way and just not listen to the counting and only listen to the clapping. And that's what I was doing. Um, and so those are the marks I came up with, given what I was hearing through his actual clapping and playing. Improvisation, maybe there's a question here about that. Oh, mini lesson. Mini lesson costs $39. Students register for that when they register for the exam and the 15 minutes gets added onto their exam time. And that mini lesson begins right after the exam. Parent and teacher can come into the room and we can have a little party. It can be serious, it can be fun, whatever, whatever the student and teacher wants. Uh, the examiner tries to let the student and teacher and the family run that mini lesson. A lot of people just want to be taught and have a little mini lesson master class using repertoire from the exam. That's totally allowable and examiners will go along with that. Okay, improvisation, two things. First, we get the lead sheet. On your marking form, it's called improv piece because again, at level five, there are three options. The student can read a lead sheet at site, which he did, or perform a 12 bar blues pattern to a backing track that they prepared somehow or access somewhere. I'll give you an idea later about what that can be, what I like to use. Because lead sheet reading is a bit bland. And then, or they can they can do their own composition. The composition may be written out in staff notation. It may not, it may be a chart. We try to encourage students to provide something to the examiner just to show that they've been thinking about the structure of it. Um, that was the first thing you heard, 3.6 out of five. Counting aloud adds another task that can take away from formulating left-hand chords in time. So the way he did lead sheet reading, it was quite hesitant. That's normally what we see uh, for whatever reason. I, I think that, you know, you can see on the, on the CI canons and there's a lot to cover. And by the time it gets to the lead sheet reading, because there isn't as much time to address it within the context of an exam, you see a lot of teachers find a way to do the 12 bar blues pattern for the students. They just simply get to improvise again and create something from scratch. Uh, the etude, I'll give you an example. This is from APP, American Popular Piano, Etudes Book 5. Uh, he told me what three he prepared. I asked him to play Grizzly. He didn't want to play Grizzly. He wanted to play It Takes Two, so I obliged that. And he did it very well. He gets perfect marks. But our typical response to that, because this is a bit of a common, not common, it does come up once in a while in actual exams where students would only prepare one A2 for one reason or another. We're happy that they're doing it, but they're not going to get seven out of seven. We usually take two marks off, so that's why you see five out of seven there. It's not for anything he didn't do. It's just for the fact that he chose which A2 he wanted to do. For his real exam, he's going to get the other two in order and, and he'll be fine. But we do see from time to time the odd student doing that, and that's our standard penalty for that in terms of marking. Um, within here, he learns three of the six, there's eight A2s actually in this book. Uh, backing tracks are on our website, and there are these modules. It's a great book, but again, I don't use it much with my students. I teach it all by rote. Here's what a standard chart looks like in the top right corner. There's a note set that students can improvise from. And we get a scripted left hand chord suggestion all written out so that you can match along with the backing track and the right hand. You get some seed ideas here in line two, and then some suggested rhythms, but the student has to just improvise on their own. I find this a bit tedious. I like to use this so that students can see the chord and count along and get the left hand down but I don't show the student the right hand at all. I make them improvise their whole right hand with the backing track without even looking at this. I even make them figure out what key it's in themselves with their ear. It's a pure ear exercise. And then we go through a process of putting your hands together. By level five, uh, my students can do it pretty well because they've already done it for five years or more. Okay, can't see me. Is my, okay, my, my video, yeah. My, my video is broadcasting from what I can tell, Corinne. It might be something on your end there. Thanks for the heads up though. Um, now where the confusion starts is in this book, there's this set of how you can do it takes two. And then you turn the page and there's module two, which is similar, but with different seat ideas. The same chords in the left hand, but in a different rhythm. The same note set, different seat ideas for the treble clef in the right hand. So teachers have gotten in the habit of thinking, you know, despite our efforts here to try and say otherwise, there's a third module with different ideas, and there's a fourth module with different ideas, all on different charts. Um, the foundation is the same. They all work with the backing track, 
I don't make my students learn all four modules. In fact, I don't make my students even learn a single module. The trouble is on in our syllabus, it says that the examiner will hand the student one of the four modules as a visual aid if they need it. And that causes confusion because people think they have to play those seed ideas, but they don't. They don't have to play anything on the page. As long as it sounds into the backing track, you should follow the left-hand chord voices. This student had, was going from root position to root position. Not ideal. And sometimes he was, sometimes he wasn't. It's hard for me to see, but but that's you should follow the voicings that the left hand gives you in the book. Then you'll be safe. Um, they'll sound better when they're using inversions. The whole idea that this series builds is building a left hand that's used to comping. Comping is playing chords in the left hand in around the middle of the keyboard so that if you're ever in a band situation with a jazz band, you're staying out of the way of the bass, who's got the lowest notes, and you're staying away from the solo line, which is typically an octave higher, which the right hand is improvising to. So that's a little background about how the etudes work. Watch my video tutorials if that's new to you and you're curious about how it works. Just know that nowadays, because we went to the pandemic and we couldn't, the examiner couldn't hand necessarily a student a module to play from, we give students the license to choose their own module if they needed anything at all to look at. They can now look at whatever they want during the exam for the A2 visually if they need to. And they don't have to follow what's on the page. They don't have to tell us what they're looking at. And we're going to rescript the syllabus so that's clear in the syllabus this coming year so that you see that in writing as well. Any questions about that? Um, okay. Is the lead sheet mark out of five under improv piece? The lead sheet mark is out of five on improv piece. That's correct. And so I've given him 3.6 out of 5 in that case. Oral tests, uh, pretty straightforward. It's either right or wrong, except the playback is more subjective. 2.6 out of 4, is that really what I gave him? Oh, you know what? That should be 2.6 out of 3. I apologize. 2.6 out of 3, I thought it was quite good, especially for this level. That exercise or that example you heard is slightly longer than we might normally give. I'm struggling to find examples here that nobody has seen before. We don't want to compromise our examiner binders that we have out there in use. And so I gave him 2.6 out of 3. He got all the chords right, four to four interesting chords there to listen to. You can hear major and minor sevens. Intervals, only one out of 3. He's going to work on that. I gave him some simple intervals that he didn't get right. The perfect fourth going down, the perfect fifth going up. Easy to confuse those perfect intervals. In fact, I'll say this on exams. Uh, Perfect intervals, especially perfect fourths and perfect fifths, often get labeled wrong by even advanced students. Perfect fourth going down often gets thought of as the major third or minor third. And perfect fifth going up often sounds like an octave to students. So it's worth reviewing those. My exam total is 85.9. It's close to an 86, um, which is a very good mark. Um, I think that this student's potential is a 90 with just a few simple fixes. That's always the case. So students are always in process and he may very well get a 90. There's a lot of really good things going on there. A couple of thoughts in my mind. I'm just trying to remember if I'm missing anything. Oh, uh, background information and applied skills. Uh, how is that? I don't think I have a mark here. Oh yeah, 5.5 out of 6. The reason I took the half mark off was just simply, it's usually minus 0.5 for every obvious mistake. Okay. That's typically how we mark with this. And so he missed one composer. I gave him a second chance to, you know, name the composer. He just wasn't able to. That's fine. He'll get that right to the real exam and he'll get a six out of six. Feel free to tell us what you've got there. Suzanne, 85.3. Corinne, 81.2. Kim, 88.7. These are all totally in the ballpark. Yeah, given the benefit, thinking the mic wasn't set right. Marilyn, 85. Beautiful, yeah. This is, this is, these are very good marks for him. We're all in the, we're all in the ballpark here with the marks. That's wonderful. You'll see variations sometimes from piece to piece. And sometimes, especially the first piece, you get an idea of what a student's doing. Everything's in a hurry. But again, with the critical listening protocol, we're trying to think broadly, not too detailed. I want to leave room, you know, how's the second piece go? And so, ooh, that was better than I expected. So I'm going to, you know, that mark may inflate a tiny little bit. And then the third piece really gives you an indication of what where the students at. You know, you know, was that a fluke? Is it better still, or, or is reality come falling? You know, and so we weave this little dance, and sometimes the marks get adjusted a little bit in our minds, leaving a little bit of wiggle room, depending on what we've heard, depending on how well the technique was prepared sometimes. But I mean, these wiggle rooms are like instead of 11.0 to 12, I'm gonna give them 11.1. Instead of 10.9, I'm gonna give them 10.7. 
And then we look at the overall mark at the end. It's like, okay, is this fair for this student? So we get a whole number. Is, is this an 86, an 87, an 85? And we go back and adjust the marks if necessary. I'll say, you know, when I've been adjudicating music festivals the last month a little bit, one was online, one was actually in person. The online one was interesting because I could go back and listen a second time. I could really make sure I got it right. And I'm realizing the value in that now. And even with this exam, I went back after and adjusted 0.1, 0.2 here and there just to really get it right because it's so easy to miss things. We have to make such quick decisions. Live in-person festivals, I don't know. I I just think they're, they're really difficult to pull off. I'm just not as much a fan of that anymore when there's marks and placings and competition involved. I'm just, it, I find it really difficult. And I'm sure people know they attend these things with their students. Um, it, it's just really hard to see how that how that can work in, in a way when things are so rushed, so so quick. It's it's just hard to get it right. And so, part of what we try to do at Conservatory Canada, you know, this particular exam would we allot twenty five minutes for that recording took twenty seven minutes. You know, we have no we have no rush, no no worry. We try to take our time to get it right. A grade one exam is twenty minutes. A grade eight exam is forty minutes. There's lots of time there for us to get it right. And, and, and most examiners, I think, take more time than I might in between pieces to make sure that they are getting it right, to write up the comments, all that kind of stuff. Go ahead and raise your question. Or raise your hand with the raise your hand feature. If you have any questions, type them in the chat box. Uh, and if you want to come on live and discuss something that you've seen or you know a, a more detailed question, I have time here to do that today. I'm just glad that you took the time to hang out with me here and take a look at Contemporaneous Piano. It's exciting to be able to unveil this in a different way for everybody, especially at this intermediate level. There's a lot to it. I think a lot of students really benefit from it. Um, students have to be committed, I think, still. They have to have time to do this kind of thing. Uh, but I, even classical students, I'll do the improv right from level one, and if they have some kind of desire to do it, if they do take the backing tracks home and actually work on these things, I keep it going in case at some point they want to dive into contemporary idioms. Sometimes I get transfer students who are already into contemporary idioms and they're used to that kind of workload and dedication. Um, there's a lot to it. Uh, comping. Okay. Um, yeah, hey, Marilyn, thanks for mentioning that. Here's, here's how this American popular piano works. Levels one to five builds the foundation of these chords in the left hand. And by level five, you're finally getting three note chords. Before level five, it's only two note chords, these shell voicings that are often in tritones. One, four, and five, only a semitone apart. So the comping is there right from level one. Level two, for sure. Level three, level four. By the time you get to level five, you add a third note into the mix. They're learning comping. When you get to level six, everything changes. The approach to the book is a little bit different. There are finally chord symbols for the first time. So levels one to five, it's really a pure ear base. We don't burden them with the theory or anything behind it. Keeping their ears open, trying to distract the eyes, right? Close the eyes off and just listen. And then level six, they start to introduce chord symbols and finally give you the theory behind it. I think it's ingenious. I follow this with my students too. If I have an older student doing level three, I'll show them what's behind these tritones in the left hand, how they're actually shells of seventh chords. And on the piano, when we're comping, we don't play. <laughs> One, four, five, one, using sevenths in root position, we don't do that, we go. And so even at this level, by this level five, the student knows how to comp and they don't even know it. Okay, same with lead sheet reading. We want them that sight reading lead sheet. We want them to be around middle C somewhere with voice leadings that, that are in around the middle. So this, this really addresses comping in a nice way and brings it out in them. Anything else? I'm going to check with see if anyone's got their hand raised that I'm not catching. I don't see any hands raised. Boy, you're a great crowd. I'm going to stop sharing here so I can come back on. Okay, well, not hearing any questions. Feel free to go back and look at this in more detail if you want. Feel free to send me your email questions or thoughts. Check out the video tutorials if you're interested in this. Next week, we're going to talk about digital badges. Digital badges uh, work like this students who don't have time to sit a full certificate exam. Like you can imagine how, how, many, how, how many hours the students put into this exam, and we know because we've done it with our students. The digital badge, you only have to record three pieces, pre-record them one at a time, anytime throughout the year, whenever the students are working or last year or whatever, you keep files of these things. The students can re-record them, they can watch themselves. It's a huge learning tool. I love doing this now with my students with online recitals. They get so picky 
and the last two months we've just been working on this reporting and getting picky and working on our performance skill without the live audience there, of course. Digital badge, you pre-record three pieces when they're all ready. You register and submit three links to YouTube or however, whatever sharing service you want to use. And examiner will go in and assess the three performances at whatever level, level one to 10. It's piano repertoire only right now. Uh, repertoire is wide open. Students can choose whatever they want as long as those pieces are at that level. You don't even need approval for the pieces as long as the teacher thinks they're there. And the examiner gives really helpful, concise comments, much like how I've given really direct feedback on what's going well, uh, maybe one or two things to improve if they need to improve, and we give them a gold, silver, or bronze standing, and the students get a digital badge, a fancy JPEG of a really nice design. And next week, I'll talk more in detail about this process, how it can work, how students can earn recognition for their work, even though they don't have time to, to do a full certificate exam. Maybe you need a student who needs to lead into the certificate exam, and this is a nice intermediate step because they're busy doing athletics and other things, or they're their interest and their curiosity comes and goes throughout the year. You can just capture a few of those peaks and still find a way to get them to engage in this kind of process. Uh, the fees start at $49 for grade one to four. If the student's not happy with their standing, if they get a silver or a bronze, uh, it's pretty easy to get silver, I think. Um, they can pay half the fee and upgrade by re resubmitting the three links and we'll assess it again a second time. Uh, so that is what digital badges is about next week. And then the final webinar of the year on the 27th, we're gonna do a grade two classical exam, which I'm gonna record two of in the next few days. I'm gonna pick one of them. We're gonna we're gonna do the same process with that to finish off the webinar year. I'm entertaining thoughts of changing up our format a little bit for next, or expanding this format on the Friday webinar. So that next year, I would like to build the simulcast on YouTube, have a YouTube channel that are dedicated to all of this so that you, you don't have to wait for replay links from me to view anything. They'll be there all the time. Um, and we can just capture a lot broader interest. You can still register for a webinar though if you wanted to attend live and interact like this. I've enjoyed it very much. And I look forward to the next two weeks. Thanks for your comments. I don't think I've missed anything. Sorry if I've missed any questions. I don't see any hands raised, so we'll sign off for there. Hope you all have a good weekend. I look forward to seeing you next week so we can talk about digital badges. It's just being tested out. We haven't launched this fully. We're going to do another webinar in the fall, but our database is ready to register it for anyone who wants to try a digital badge and help us test this out over the next few months. Uh, you can do that. And I'll give you more info next week. Thanks for your attention and have a great week. And I'll talk to you again soon.